Um, Ms. Sandler, are you ready to go? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, we can hear you just fine. Please go ahead. I can't remember if DT is going to present your slides or, or what. DT, yeah, DT is going to present my slides. And DT, I hope you're ready because we're going to go through a bunch of slides really quickly. Yes. <laughs> OK. All right, so, so let's do it. Uh, Karen will probably have to correct me, but she is the executive director of the Free Software Conservancy and I'm told has a longstanding interest in open source medical devices. Um, so as we begin this session, um, I'd like to um, just uh, thank all the attendees for staying here. This has been, for me, kind of a breathless three hours. Uh, we're getting to the end here. We're maybe pivoting to talking about the future. Um, I really appreciate all 112 of you paying attention during this period of time. Uh, uh, we're going to hear from Ms. Sandler and then Dale Doherty of Make Magazine, and then um, DT and I will just very shortly close the uh, conference. Thank you. Great. And I want to start out by uh, thanking you, Robert and DT, for this fantastic conference and all of the other speakers. Um, the work that you're all doing is incredibly inspiring. Um, so I'm going to give you a very quick introduction to who I am and why I care about um, free and open source software on medical devices. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So I come at this as a um, as a former developer engineer um, turned lawyer. Um, turned executive director, but all informed because I'm a patient. Um, I have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which means that my heart is three times as normal, as large as an, sorry, three times as thick as a normal person's heart. Um, next slide, DD. But the, um, uh, which is fine. I'm generally asymptomatic, but I'm at a very high risk of sudden death. And so, next slide. I have a defibrillator um, implanted in my body, um, and that uh, that basically has uh, has changed the way that I view technology. I like to describe myself as a cyborg and think about the positive aspects of having this um, uh, implanted into my body. Um, so uh, next slide. Uh, going through that process of, um, of, of getting my defibrillator, I decided to launch a research process into the safety and efficacy of these devices, including FDA approval um, and the safety of the devices that were on the market and was a little bit uh, horrified by what I learned with all of the failures. Um, the Software Engineering Institute estimates that there's uh, about one bug introduced for every 100 lines of code. Um, so you could do the next uh, slide. Um, and so this took me from the medical device space um, to all of the other um, all of the other critical areas of our technology. Um, so looking at everything through the lens of not being able to see the software in my own body, which was extremely terrifying and upsetting, especially as a technical person and to feel helpless and out of control over the basic technology that I rely on um, to sort of seeing its societal implement, um, implications. Um, and this is a, a, a study that was published showing vulnerabilities in cars. Um, and I like this slide because they, uh, the car thinks that it's going at 140 miles per hour, but it also thinks it's in park. Um, and the average luxury car has about 100 million lines of code, and so that could be about 1 million defects. Next slide, please. Thanks, DT. Um, so all of this caused me to say, oh my gosh, I I don't want to use any software I can't see. So I uh, I I probably went as as radical as they come, and I stopped using proprietary software basically at all, which is extremely hard to do. And now I make uh, only very brief exceptions like this use of Zoom in order to be able to speak to all of you good people. Um, so I, uh, I worked on the Software Freedom Conservancy and other free and open source software initiatives to make sure that we had alternatives to proprietary software and that we could solve these problems in a large and holistic way. So next uh, slide, please. I was really convinced everything was all about transparency and openness. I hear a lot of discussions here about, um, you know, third party review and, and the fact that we need to have transparency and order and openness in order to solve important questions. Um, uh, for me, I, I, I thought that was the entire story. And then when I was pregnant, um, I my heart palpitated, which is perfectly normal, as many of you know who are medical professionals. Um, and my defibrillator shocked me because my heart, it thought, was in a dangerous rhythm. And the only solution to this problem was for me to take beta blockers, which slowed my heart rate down so much so that I had trouble walking up a flight of stairs. 
So um, all of this made me realize that, hold on, wait a second, only 15% of defibrillators go to people under the age of 65. My defibrillator, I'm not, I'm just not the typical use case scenario because the device manufacturers definitely do not want pregnant ladies getting shocked, right? So it went for me from being free and open source software, I realized at that moment became as much about control over your device as it became about um, about transparency. It's not just about being able to see it. It's about also being able to um, to make changes on it. I had no ability to evaluate what my device was doing, let alone work with my medical professionals to adjust that for my case, let alone work collectively with all of the medical device professionals. Um, so um, and the and the entire community of pregnant women or other people who had interest in uh, in the same medical device. So uh, next slide, please, DP. Um, so all of this is to say, uh, you've been hearing all day about um, open source ventilator solutions and, um, and all, all sorts of other great initiatives that are happening in this space. I think that we're at the point where about, I think, something like a third of all software, probably more at this point, is free and open source software. It feels inevitable, right? Like we know that we'll, uh, we'll only have security if we have free and open source software. We know that we'll only be able to get to the market. Um, as Sarah was saying, if we use free and open source software, we'll only be able to move quickly as we need to in these urgent situations, right? Um, uh, next slide, please, Deepti. Um, so there are all these reasons why free and open source software is going to be, you know, has been incorporated into everything and is becoming more um, and more standard and companies, as Marta was saying, are less afraid of it, that, uh, that, that they no longer need to rely on those monopolistic IP um, solutions. But does it necessarily help us build a better future? When you're using open technology in the way that you all are to create on the ground quick medical solutions that are going to save people's lives, Obviously, that is definitely going to be the case. Um, I think but we're seeing a lot of free and open source software that is being distributed by companies for motives that are other than making the world better. And that's fine. There is room for all different kinds of motives. And we come together and we, um, and we, uh, we, we find our collaborators where they come and we work together to do something together. Um, I think that there are ways in which free open source software helps move forward in, in a way that actually brings us appreciable freedom that can control our devices and our, um, our technology. And never has that been more important than in the medical space. So next slide, DT, please. Uh, the details on how this is implemented matter a lot in terms of whether or not the solutions are going to make a difference in a, in a, in a positive way. So uh, next slide. I realize I am running out of time. Um, I want to use this example of the, um, the Puritan Bennett 560, which, um, which was released by Medtronic. Super great of medical device manufacturers to make their designs available in a crisis. That is fantastic. And they released that. Um, they released their designs and their, uh, you know, but they released the, their stuff under a permissive license only for the time of of the of COVID. So next slide. Um, and so that's that's a that's interesting um, because it's it's time limited. We can only use that right now. Now that is incredibly helpful right now. But, uh, but it only is helpful um, to, to, to some extent. I'm using this example. This was uh, in the news um, uh, uh, back in March where uh, 3D, uh, there, there were valves that were being 3D printed to be able to repair um, ventilators in Italy. And this made news because at first people had thought that the, that the um, original manufacturer was preventing the 3D printing by exerting its patent models, but uh, sorry, it's patent rights. But in fact, they, they weren't. And they said, because of, probably because there was so much press about it, they said, no, 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 it's, you're okay to use it because we're in a pandemic and it's okay. Next slide, please. But the question is, is like, who decides when we're in this crisis and when will they decide that it ends? My heart situation is incredibly important to me. And, uh, and, and this situation that we have now is going to last for a, lo a long time and it's going to be different in different geographic areas. How we deal with um, this situation as it develops in different places is going to make a huge difference and relying on the largesse of manufacturers to grant temporary solutions is only a temporary solution for our problems. We have to think bigger picture about our medical care and our medical technology and how we can solve that for the long term. So next slide, please. One way that we can really pay attention to this is by paying attention to the details in licensing. Um, there are differences into how we handle licensing, and I have so little time, next slide, that I would be remiss if I didn't actually uh, talk about copyleft. 
people don't like delving into, uh, so yeah, this is the copyleft slide because it's a copyright symbol flipped on its side. People don't like paying attention to details like copy, uh, like the copyright licensing because um, it can be very boring, but it's incredibly important. Copyleft is this idea that, um, that you can take, you, you take your monopolistic control over copyright, but instead of using it to, um, to, to issue royalties and to keep control over it, you use those copyrights in order to keep it free. So a copy left license says you can do whatever you want with this. But if you do use this and distribute the change, if you make changes and distribute those changes, you must do so under the same license. So detractors used to call it viral. Um, it's like a snowballing effect to freedom. Copy left is a really powerful tool because it is a real, um, it, it's a real field leveler. It means that, um, if people are using copyleft licenses for their um, their medical devices, that means that when they're distributed, they have to be distributed along with an offer for source or the source. So that source is available, which means that if you need to use that software elsewhere, you can request the source. Under the GPL, the most popular um, uh, uh, copyleft license, um, there are a couple of them, but under the GPL, the license also requires that the source, it not only come with the corresponding complete and corresponding source code, but also the scripts to control installation, which means that you can replace the software, which is the most important thing perhaps. Next slide and I'll wrap it up. So we need to invest in our long-term healthcare stability. It can't be about this crisis. Now, I'm, Robert, you talked about uh, uh, taking plans and mothballing them for the next pandemic. We're in a situation where all of the technology that we're creating now may or may not be useful in the future. We don't know what we're going to need in the future. What we know is that we don't know what we don't know, right? Like we thought that invasive ventilators were going to be the whole thing when we started out. And it turned out that, you know, we have other needs now. And this is gonna be the case with all of our technology. So we need to plan for being able to change. And the way to be able to plan is to license everything freely, especially under copyleft wherever possible. Next slide, and I think it's my last slide. Oh, just a tiny, just one quick thing, which is that uh, uh, think about the resources we are putting into Zoom right now. Every conference that uses Zoom, every university that uses Zoom is paying royalties to a proprietary software company so that they can have more of the market share. If we take this time and invest in solutions that may not be as good and, or as turnkey, and we have a little bit of inconvenience now, we'll be able to have a situation down the road where we have control over our basic technology that we rely on. So let's make infrastructure rather than proprietary business models. And the last slide is just for Conservancy. We're also a charity. Thanks very much. Uh, Dale, can, can I have five minutes of your time and ask you to postpone your talk for five minutes? Dale, are you with us? Uh, Rob, he's, he's okay with that. Okay, thank you. Um, so there are a few questions here. Um, you know, this is not the place for a licensing debate. Uh, I'd like to point out, I support the GPL. I just took a $20,000 grant that asked me not to use it and to use the MIT license, which I'm going to do under this circumstance, but I, I support yep. uh, copy left. An anonymous attendee asked, is CERN, and I assume they mean the CERN open hardware license, good that is the official helpful recommended one i certainly have recommended it i also admit i have not fully read it ms sandler do you have an opinion about that i mean i think it's a very helpful license i think you're right i think we'd have to go into a long uh a long discussion about there is a, a quite a few licenses that um that we should uh, evaluate. And I, I won't be on Slack because again, it's a proprietary platform, but I'm on Freenode, which is an IRC network and I'm on Pound Conservancy and I'm happy to talk about licenses in depth. Okay, thank you. If, if we can boil this down to one thing, if you are an engineering team, you need to do licensing, right? There may be some questions about which license you choose, but if you're not putting a license on your work, you are probably making a mistake and limiting the usefulness to other people by not choosing a licensing strategy. Definitely, okay. by not putting a license on your work, you're basically you're basically saying all rights reserved and you introduce a lot of uncertainty and your solutions will be uh, very limited in terms of how far they can go because who is going to pick up a solution that they don't know whether they're gonna get sued on down the road. Okay, thank you. And I know as someone who codes, 
I, it, I sometimes don't put the license on there when I first start writing the code, but I should. And every one of us who has a GitHub repository, go through, find all your things, put a license on there, just take a little extra time to make that, that happen. Um, and I've started using Creative Commons for my graphics. I make a lot of graphics uh, and I just stick it down there in the corner. Okay, Dale, are you ready, sir? Yes, I am. Can you Please hear me? Go ahead. Okay. D, do you want to share my slides? So, you know, I, I, I'll try to be pretty quick here. The, I, I, first of all, appreciate everything Robert's doing in, in this conference. But, you know, what I, I've tried to focus through Make Magazine and what I do with Maker Fair is, is the Maker community and how they've kind of risen to the challenge here. And I, I've just tried to tell stories about uh, what they're doing. Uh, I call, end up calling it Plan C the idea that industry was plan A, I, I mean, excuse me, government was plan A, industry was plan B, and when neither of those uh, are reliable, you need a plan C, a backup plan for the backup plan. And, uh, and, it, and it evolved, um, Deepti, are you able to share my slide? Uh, there you go. Um, you know, uh, and uh, go on to the next, if you would. Um, and, and so, you know, I've been writing about how makers have responded, and I, I've seen this as a not just the maker community, but a model for civic response that people actually want to contribute. They want to get involved. And what, and you know, some people say, oh, well, it's medical devices. They can't get involved. But you know, the ma masks are a great example of that. Um, could you go to the next one, please? Um, and and so uh, you know, as I began seeing what different people are doing. Um, that we were in a crisis mode. Um, the CDC was saying, you know, uh, uh, medical professionals can use bandanas and scarves, and it seemed like an inadequate solution when others were available. So just, uh, you know, different groups. The man on the left with the scuba mask is a doctor who, who told me I'm a, I was a maker before I was a doctor. And so when he learned he wouldn't get PPE in the, in, in, in the, uh, his hospital in Sacramento, he built his own with his son. Uh, if you go on to the next one, this is um, this is a story of uh, in Chicago. I think it's a really reflective of of how makers came together to sort of build face shields. Initially, building um, available designs on Prusa, and then beginning to design some of their own. Um, the, the the purple ones in the middle uh, can be stacked like pancakes and on a three D printer, uh, and they can be made on the bed of a small three D printer. Uh, but the, to give you an example, the person on the left that says uh, it's holding something with orange glasses, he uh, is a public high school teacher. Um, and, uh, you know, he's never not a designer, but he came up with a, a, a flatbed uh, shield uh, that uh, could attach itself. And uh, Jackie is up in the left holding a yellow shield, began to print it in communities in Chicago that were not being uh, attended to uh, the south side and the west side in Chicago. And, and you know, others, they began, what was interesting to me is they were, they called it liberating 3D printers from universities because th those places were shut down and, uh, and museums and libraries and they began taking them home and they built a distributed network to, to um, make PPE. Next, please. It just showed you sort of a map of, of where they are and how they covered an area. So they really created their own version of a distributed manufacturing and distribution network. Next. Um, I, I won't go into this here, but I wrote a piece on challenging, you know, kind of hackathons and, and design challenges uh, that I, I think we're not engaging in how the innovation was already happening, but we're trying to maybe create a separate model that benefited them. And, and I, I think the main takeaway from this, I was trying to, particularly government agencies that were trying to use crowdsourced innovation is we'd actually like to know more about what their needs are than just have an open call and say there's some small prize at the end. Uh, next, um, Hygieia is a low cost UVC unit. Um, Akiba on the right hand corner is in Hacker Farm in Chiba Prefecture in Japan. and. He's built building you know UVC units, but he's also uh, building dosimeters to test them, and and I think it's a really fascinating uh, project. Uh, he was I think in a in a involved in SafeCast, a, another maker project after the Fukushima disaster to measure radiation throughout the country. Um, next, 
um, Atlanta, um, again, just uh, a group of community of, of different maker spaces networking together. Um, they began injection, uh, actually uh, silicon molding, uh, uh, using 3D printers to create molds and using silicon rubber to make uh, ma uh, ma uh, masks. Next, please. Um, Starvin, I wrote recently, Pat, I believe is on this call. Um, he, you know, he, he built, he's a professor at Full Sail University in Orlando, um, but a maker that I ran into last year and he had built his ambu bag type of vent, uh, a ventilator. Next, please. And the Montana masks, it's a doctor on the left who, when his hospital told him he was not, he would have to reuse masks, he said, that's not a good idea. I'm a neurosurgeon and I get blood all over my mask. I need one for each surgery I do. So he came up with a new mask. Um, but I think part of the story here was not only how it happened in Billings, Montana of all places, but how it spread around the world. And the woman there, Corey Hawks, really is a volunteer, a, a wife of a uh, a, a Air Force physician who through a network of wives of physicians learned about this and she said, how can I help? And she built a website, began to ex expand it and uh, they open sourced it recently, the mask and, and, and it's really spread around. So I, I think the next please, um, I think I have one more on, this is Artisan's Asylum in, in uh, uh, Somerville, Massachusetts, which is you know, now running um, three shifts a day making hospital gowns or isolation gowns, uh, which they reverse engineer. They're also making tools for folding surgical masks, uh, 3D printed tools, and even selling those to factories. So I see this as unleashing this power. Uh, many ways, uh, maker spaces uh, are something that, if you go to the next one, have, have been uh, we've been building this kind of infrastructure for 10 years and some people don't even know what it's good for. And a little bit like what Karen was talking about, it's open, it's an open community. Can you go to the next one, please? Uh, uh, you know, we started to share, um, this is the next issue of the magazine, uh, which we're covering uh, on this, I'm calling this sort of countermeasures for COVID-19. Um, there. Uh, and and I, I'm really interested in this idea of civic infrastructure. Uh, it, it's not discussed enough, it's not valued enough, and it's obviously, we're, we, ha we were lucky to have some of this in place, um, but it's in a fairly rudimentary, under-resourced fashion today. It doesn't fit business models, but I think it's actually a way to think about the future, along with like public invention. How do we solve for problems that don't have upfront business models? How do we how do we, uh, how do you, you know, the, the other thing is there's so much competence in people in our, in our country and around the world. And how do we leverage that? How do we, uh, what I find so interesting about the helpful engineering and open source medical supplies group is look who's joining them. There are people that have day jobs in big companies, but they're joining these groups because they can make a difference and they can contribute. And there's something missing in government and industry that is not allowing people to contribute to solutions. So um, that's what we need to build. And just maybe um, this weekend, Saturday, we have a virtually maker fair. Next slide, please. And I have kind of just a Flynn slide. You might have to click on that deep D to see if it'll work, but um, it's just a, uh, you know, it's just the way makers are, <laughs> you know, to create, create a mask that promotes uh, the event. So, um, and if you just go to the next one, uh, so, we, we have uh, about 350 entries of projects and sessions this weekend, um, uh, all online, just like this. Um, a remarkable job here done by Rob and, and Deep D and team. Um, and I think the idea is just open this up so we can have more visibility into what's going. When I, when I saw Kareen talk about Kenya, it's the same pattern in many, many places. And how do we begin to inform, I guess my role and others is just try to connect these efforts and, and talk about them. So people understand what they're doing and perhaps people that are not involved with them understand the value of this and begin to support this infrastructure in the community. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much. Um, I get, uh, I, Dale, you're being thanked by an anonymous attendee. I don't actually see any questions here. Um, thank you, everybody. I was very rude to our speakers and forced them to stick to a, a ridiculous timeline. Hopefully, the attendees appreciated getting a lot of information. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes here and maybe any of the panelists who have a closing thought before I give my own closing thoughts uh, can, can add something. Um, if I may. 
Go ahead, Dr. Sarah. So I think that uh, I, I want to take into account what Karen just mentioned about 3D printing. And also as part of the, let's say, closure of the idea of, of funding and how we need to, uh, let's say, uh, measure our steps or plan ahead as it relates to, uh, are we thinking a, a short term, long term? For instance, uh, some of the, the funding options are uh, 24 months uh, just to obtain and et cetera, et cetera. So I just want uh, to uh, convey the thought that it's very important to understand that we are in a dynamic, uh, that fast paced uh, situation. And we need to sometimes be able to maneuver fast enough uh, in order to adjust and these circumstances. So I, just a thought. Thank you. Uh, you know, personally, I'm an agilist from a computer software point of view. I believe in being agile and going fast. Um, I believe Elon Musk and SpaceX have shown the benefit of that even for engineering. Um, it's a challenge to go fast when you're making a life critical medical device. Uh, it's not a challenge that can't be met, but it is a challenge. Uh, does anyone else like to say something? If I can comment, having said that, uh, we see uh, how the government has reacted, especially uh, due to the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis, where they've expedited various processes as it relates to uh, drug approval and, and, and other uh, you know, uh, what we call bureaucracies. So that gives us some kind of, uh, let's say, there is a room to set new expectations in the way that we define what is the appropriate, uh, let's say, process of, of doing things. And maybe um, rethinking those processes could actually help us move uh, much uh, faster in the long run. Right. Uh... Okay, if no one else oh, has, I, have, yeah, I guess I could yeah, go ahead, Michelle. Oh, Tim. No, Tim, Michelle. Tim first, then Michelle. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that um, this has been a really amazing conference um, and it doesn't have to stop here. I think there's, it's been interesting to hear um, different perspectives and, to, and people disagreeing even among the panelists um, on focuses and, and other things. Um, and so I think that uh, keeping in contact with each other is really important. Um, you, we can do that in the um, closing resources channel um, in, in Slack. Um, and I would encourage everyone to, to, to keep active and um, keep talking because we don't get through this, you know, with one three hour session. We got to um, keep working together. Thank you, Tim. Um, I'm going to reiterate that in my own talk, but go ahead, Michelle. I think kind of the one last thing I wanted to close with, and I had some good discussions with people on on Slack uh, this morning, is that you know I think you know we're talking about the need for lower cost solutions and, and lower cost ventilators and other places, and I think from you know the perspective of someone who studied pulmonary biomechanics, I think really um, the thing I would want to reiterate is identifying safe ventilation is difficult, even when you have the best technology that is available to you. And as you seek out solutions, I think it's important, and uh, Rebecca addressed this in, in her talk um, for EWB, which I've been um, involved with them a little bit as well. And I think you know that's really uh, knowing which kinds of, of treatments are really the most appropriate for your region and what can you implement quickly when it comes to um, you know, do you have the drugs to keep people under? Do you have the trained staff? Because it really is easy to use a ventilator in a way that can do more harm than good. And I think everyone here is really interested in, in doing a lot of good. Um, and so I think I just kind of want to end on that, that slight note of caution, but um, also I think really a note of hope. Okay, uh, anyone else? Just to finish, Robert? Uh, Marcos, go ahead. So. We are in a very deep humanitarian crisis worldwide. The problems are infinite. And the ways of approaching these infinite problems are also infinite. We've, we have to think outside the box, totally outside the box. The system that has took us for the last 400 years 
didn't work. We are like drowning ourselves on a virus. On the micro scale, on the nano scale, to the macro scale of the economies. We have to think on a chaotic way of solving problems. I like to remember when NASA developed a pen that could write on space and invested $100 million on that while Russians prefer to use a pencil. So uh, there are very several ways to solve problems. And I think that communication is essential. Dialogue between people that think different is essential. We have to change everything in the system, not only the health system and the manufacturing system, but the validation system, the regulatory system, the funding system. We have to solve that in a global way of thinking because we are now a global village. We are all people speaking from five different continents trying to solve a problem worldwide that we don't even know where to start walking, but we know where we don't want to go walking. We don't want to go walking on a proprietary way. We don't want to go walking on an exclusive and differential way. I think all, he, all, all people here are working on that. I really am grateful for being side by side to you, uh, working this every day. And uh, I let my contacts open for anyone willing to help also on third world, okay. world, third world countries. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to read a comment from uh, Govind Tadachari. Amazing conference. Thank you all. The pandemic affects everyone and we need to encourage everyone to help contribute in their own way. I absolutely agree with that. Um, let me take a few minutes before I begin uh, our very short closing presentation to just review what we have had. As Marco said, maybe it's a little uh, purple, but I don't think so. We're doing something that has never been done before. As a planet, we are addressing a crisis which has never existed before, and we're using tools that were not available to people before to address these problems. Um, we're working in very difficult circumstances in a presence of tremendous uncertainty, financial uncertainty, even medical uncertainty, transportational supply chain uncertainty, and yet we are working to solve the problem. Um, as uh, Dr. Griffer said from NIST, we have a further problem that there may be a surplus of sophisticated ventilators in the United States by July, which we probably don't have a good way to get to Brazil, Kenya, or Guatemala, for example, uh, which only makes our problem more complicated. Nonetheless, um, and I suspect many of us, I know I'm tired of being locked down in my home too. And I'm also a little tired of working on ventilators. We don't know for sure how many lives this effort is going to save. I'm, I'm not talking about PPE. I know that's going to save lives. I'm talking about ventilators. I, I don't know when the first patient is going to be saved by a ventilator done by a team on this call. I don't know how many people are going to be saved. It might be zero. I think you know we have to be honest and admit that possibility. But it might be a million. It might, it might be 3 million for all I know. There's a great deal of uncertainty in the future. So I just want to review some of the things that have happened. I think as a community, we are in the middle of the game. This is, if you play chess, this is the mid game. We, we, some things happened and we have learned some things. We've learned some medical things. We've learned some things about regulation. We've learned some things about financing. We've learned some things about how to work together in a planetary community in a certain way. Um, Dr. Schultz has said, uh, we need more power. We've learned we need non-invasive ventilation, which requires more sophisticated ventilators than we started out making. Um, Karen has poignantly, Karen Chandler has poignantly pointed out that we need the freedom to modify the, de the devices, not just to, to see the code. But why do we need the freedom to modify? Because as Marcos knows, the supply chain is not present in Kenya or Brazil based on what may have been designed in the United States. Um, we also need these kinds of uh, 
modularity and openness for a number of other reasons. So um, if no one, uh, let, let me go into this talk uh, just so we can, we can finish up on time. I'd like to thank everybody um, who, who has, has joined us.